This address was given at the Reformed Forum Theology Conference held at Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Grays Lake, Illinois, on October 7, 2023. The conference theme was 100 Years of Christianity and Liberalism, J. Gresson Machen's Theological Legacy. Visit reformedforum.org rf23 for more information about the event. This lecture is made available for free through the generous support of Harvest USA. For more than 40 years, Harvest USA has been providing Christ-centered, practical discipleship, resources, and training for the church in the areas of biblical sexuality and gender. They benefit many churches through their commitment to a Reformed theological perspective applied to real-life struggles with temptation and sin in these areas. Check out their website, harvestusa.org, for free magazines, blogs, discipleship curricula, as well as contact info if you or a loved one needs help. Uh, it's nice to be here with you. I, I appreciate Camden jiggering the schedule so that I could <clears throat> fly in from Omaha this morning and I can actually now compare Baptist conferences to Presbyterian conferences, having spoken at the Pactum conference last night, which was a, which was a delight. They actually wanted me to speak about Machen as well. Um, so, uh, let me proceed. Do you believe the headlines? Do you believe those who edit and report on the news? These are fairly important questions three year after the pandemic, three years after the pandemic, 12 years at least into the predictions of the planet Earth's extinction. Then we have reporting on trans athletes and police, not to mention the scandals that haunt various celebrities and the slant that news organizations put on them. We have many reasons to be skeptical about journalists, whether from MSNBC or Fox, but is it okay for Christians to be skeptical? <clears throat> Does not the Bible encourage us to hope all things, to set our minds on things above? And if we do have a problem with what the reporter is saying, shouldn't we follow the Matthew 18 model? Don't we have an obligation to hear them out until we ask for clarification. Astute listeners may see the problem of trying to follow the Book of Discipline too carefully when taking in the news. How exactly do I set up an appointment with Sean Hannity? And will he be available for that second meeting when I bring along an elder from my congregation? <laughs> it turns out that J. Gresson Machen is a guide to such dilemmas and even an encouragement to those inclined to be skeptical about the most recent current thing. Machen himself seemed to be fully capable of questioning what was reported on the surface and considering the news subtext. He at least didn't believe everything he read. How could he when deans of Protestant seminaries like Shaler Matthews were saying that modernist theology was an expression of evangelical Protestantism? For Machen to write what he did in Christianity and liberalism to have the temerity to claim and then support the assertion that liberal Protestantism is not Christianity but another form of religion, he needed to rely on powers of disbelief, namely not simply to discern but also doubt the claims of his fellow Protestant ministers. Take for instance what he wrote about a news story that gave statistics on increasing church membership. <clears throat> Machen wrote, last week it was reported that the churches of America increased their membership by 690,000. Are you encouraged by these figures? <clears throat> I, for my part, am not encouraged a bit. <laughs> I have indeed my own grounds for encouragement, especially those which are found in the great and precious promises of God. But these figures have no place among them. How many of these 690,000 names do you think are really written in the Lamb's Book of Life? A small proportion, I fear. Now, that's a little tough. Doesn't Machen want to be the swell guy, team player, give reporters in church sessions the benefit of the doubt, have confidence in the brethren even? Machen has had his reasons, though, for not looking on the bright side of the news. He continued to write in that same essay, church membership today often means nothing more, as has well been said, than a vague admiration for the moral character of Jesus. The church in countless communities is little more than a rotary club. Nothing wrong with rotary Rotarians, by the way. They're not Masons, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Machen goes on, one day as I was walking through a neighboring city, I saw not an altar with an inscription to an unknown God, but something that filled me with far more sorrow than that could have done. I saw a church with a large sign on it, which read something like this, not a member, come in and help us make this a better community. Truly we have wandered far from the day when entrance into the church involved confession of faith in Christ as savior from sin. End of quotation. So to ask the question that seems obvious from framing Machen this way, to inquire where his skepticism came from may seem like an obvious one. Machen was a Calvinist, an old school Presbyterian, trained at Princeton Seminary, which had a tradition of polemical theology and questioning the best of theological rivals. And yet Machen was a relatively lone voice among Presbyterians of his day, even fellow graduates of Princeton Seminary. Many others had his theological training and the awareness that came with it, and these Calvinists did not rise up to question church board reports or prominent Protestant preachers. Even the few who did eventually abandoned Machen, possibly because he wouldn't stop questioning church boards and fellow Presbyterians. He was simply too negative for too long. This makes Machen my role model. <laughs> It doesn't go over real well at home, so just, just so you know. <clears throat> Another way to explain Machen is to inquire what was the drinking, what was in the drinking water in Baltimore, a city that produced both Machen and another prominent skeptic of the same era, H.L. Mencken. And I probably should introduce Mencken here briefly to say that he was the dominant literary force in the first three decades of the 20th century. He started as a journalist, reporter, then he became a columnist, then he became an editor of, of uh, literary magazines and made an unbelievable dent on American letters um, for a guy who only had a high school education. I mean, everybody, I and mean, he was one of the gatekeepers of literary life. So I was trying to, th I tried to think of equivalents. I'm teaching a course on Mencken now. I try to think of equivalents today. So think of Tucker Carlson, think of, um, um, some other, but then they, they have this literary side. They, they do all this literary criticism. There's, there's really very difficult to find figures like Mencken. Of course, Machen never saw The Wire, but he did have an into, this was just set in, the ball, in Baltimore, by the way. It's a great, maybe the best TV show ever made. And also it comes R-rated, so lots of warnings for that. It's not a, it's not a family show. <clears throat> He never saw The Wire, but he did have an intuition, okay, maybe a pious version of it that goes along with some of the city's better cultural expressions. Say what you will about the city by the inner harbor. It has outkicked its coverage by inspiring more amazing cultural expressions per capita than any other American city. What, munis what municipality can compete not only with The Wire, but also Barry Levinson's four movies about Jewish American life Diner, Tin Men, Avalon, and Liberty Heights. Throw into that list the literary outpouring of Mencken and the theological flair of Machen, and you have at least a city in common, if not an urban sensibility, with sufficient confidence both to make assertions about the world and the bravery to depart from the consensus of polite opinion. Before trying to explain a Baltimore outlook, let me start by showing what it looked like in Machen's day. <clears throat> Between 1898 and 1920, the United States finally took center stage as a nation with sufficient power to rival Europe's. Before the end of the 19th century, American diplomacy and nation building extended largely to securing the borders, securing borders in North America and seeking, uh, sorry, and keeping Europe's colonial reach out of the Western Hemisphere. The United States could live with a loyalist Canada as long as the British Empire was a welcome network for Americans to do business and stay out of war. Likewise, Americans could tolerate a Spanish-speaking country to the south as long as Mexico did not impede the extension of America to the Pacific Ocean. But <clears throat> with the Spanish-American War of 1898, the United States began to flex its muscles in ways that suggested the Republic in North America could compete and even outdo Europe's power in the world. Senator Albert Beveridge was typical of national sentiments that tempted Americans to build their own empire. 
In his March of the Flag speech from 1898, the U.S. Senator from Indiana boasted, quote, it is a noble land that God has given us, a land <clears throat> that, pardon me, <clears throat> a land that can feed and clothe the world, a land whose coastlines would enclose half the countries of Europe, a land like a sentinel between the two imperial oceans of the globe, a greater England with a nobler destiny. It is a mighty people that he has planted on this soil, a people sprung from the most masterful blood of history, a people imperial by virtue of their power, by right of their institutions, by authority of their heaven-directed purposes, the propagandists and not the misers of liberty. It is a glorious history our God has bestowed upon his chosen people, a history hero, heroic with faith in our mission and our future, a history of statesmen who flung the boundaries of the Republic out into unexplored lands and salvage, savage wilderness, a history of soldiers who carried the flag across blazing deserts and through the ranks of hostile mountains, even to the gates of sunset, a history of a multiplying people who overran a continent in a half century, a history of prophets who saw the consequences of evils inherited from the past and of martyrs who died to save us from them. This was a pro-war speech, if you can't tell. The Great War, in about 15 years, now numbered as the First World War, confirmed America's sense of greatness. Although Woodrow Wilson, who lived in Baltimore between 1883 and 1886, while a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, Machen and Mencken were both children at the time. When, when Wood, Wilson was there, Mencken was born in 1880, Machen in 1881. Wilson tried to keep the United States out of the European conflict that began in 1914. He even ran successfully for re-election in 1916 on, on his record of staying out of the war. <clears throat> but his decision to fight on the side of the Allies was yet another feature feather in the cap of national greatness. Not only did the United States intervention enable the Allies to defeat the Axis powers, but Wilson conceived of the war as a cosmic struggle between the forces of light and darkness. In 1917, President Wilson told Congress, quote, our subject now as then is to vindicate the principles of peace and justice in the life of the world as against selfish and autocratic power. The world must be safe for democracy. We have no selfish ends to serve. We are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind. So to such a task, we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes everything that we are and everything that we have with the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured, God helping her, she can do no other." End of quote. If the United States could win a war like that and do it for righteous reasons, she was undoubtedly great. Prominent Baltimoreans, however, were dubious about America's new status. H.L. Mencken was arguably the greatest debunker of national pretensions, but he found an unlikely ally in Machen, a native of the city as well and second son of Arthur W. Machen, one of the city's leading attorneys during the Progressive Era. And when I was telling this story, I think last night, but when I ser served jury duty in Baltimore while well, I was in graduate school, living there with my wife, went into the, uh, the waiting room to be, be selected for uh, jury duty in the city courthouse. And there was a huge portrait of Machen's father, Arthur W. Machen there in the, in the city uh, courthouse. <clears throat> so they were a very prominent family in Baltimore. By the end of the war, Mencken was already on record with a controversial dismissal of the nation's purposes in Europe. After the war and the debacle of Wilson's plans to establish a liberal world order, Mencken believed the president's denials of selfishness were all the more preposterous. The United States had not acted out of benign disinterest, but had taken England's side against Germany, even if Wilson pretended to do so for virtuous ends. <clears throat> Mencken wrote, despite all the current highfalutin about melting pots and national destinies, the United States remains almost as much an English colony, colonial possession intellectually and spiritually as it was on July 3rd, 1776. Most of the essential policies of Dr. Wilson between 1914 and 1920 were to all intents and purposes those of a British colonial premier. 
He went into the peace conference willing to yield everything to English interests, and he came home with a treaty that was so extravagantly English that it fell an easy prey to the anti-English minority. By the way, Mencken was a German-American, very sympathetic to Germany, as you might imagine, even had to stop writing uh, during the war because of his um, favorable things he said about the Kaiser. <clears throat> So all of this talk about rights of man, all this talk about democracy or justice, from Mencken's, from Mencken's perspective, Wilson's war interest was simply a reflection of the United States' national interests cloaked in the generic pieties of Christian morality. For different reasons, Machen, who served at the front in France as a secretary for the YMCA, don't laugh too hard about that, where he sold hot chocolate and cigarettes and led Bible studies on the side, Machen was also skeptical about America's self-proclaimed virtues, and having studied in Germany as a graduate student, there were reasons why he, he had friends in Germany and he liked Germany for different reasons. Machen's objections to the Wilson administration were private prior to the war, namely surfacing in letters to congressional representatives and newspapers. He was especially opposed to the draft. After the war, Machen joined Mencken in, in debunking the vulgar jingoism and self-righteousness that Americans took from the war. Combat that, quote, provi had provided a convenient scapegoat in Germany, sorry, I'm not gonna do the quote thing, uh, that Germany involved moral dangers like thinking that Americans, especially servicemen, possessed a human goodness that made religion unnecessary. He complained that modern preachers were saying to veterans, and I think this is something Dr. Tipton uh, quoted earlier, you men are very good in self-sacrificing, and we take pleasure in revealing to your goodness to you. Now, since you are so good, you will probably be interested in Christianity, which we believe is good enough even for you. That's a quote from, from Machen. For Machen, such pride, national pride, was unbecoming for Christians as well as for Americans. Over the course of the 1920s, as the nation gradually accepted its mission as a beacon of progress, freedom, and democracy to the world, these two Baltimoreans, Mencken and Machen, remained outspokenly skeptical. Their criticisms escal escalated to national prominence in the year 1926, when each man went up against institutions designed to maintain the nation's superiority. These episodes, Mencken's battle with literary censors in Boston, and Machen's feud with Presbyterian prohibitionists provide important clues to their reservations about America, American exceptionalism. Their attitude suggests a skepticism about grandiose ideas, a capacity to see through pretension, a measure of modesty about human striving, genuine distrust of power. Whether it is a distinctly Baltimorean outlook is certainly debatable, but during the 1920s, these two Baltimoreans created headlines by reminding Americans that they and their nation were not nearly as much on the right side of history as their political and intellectual leaders said. In fact, the year between the summers of 1925 and 1926, though that was a year of peak Baltimore. For many Americans, including contemporary historians, 1925 was arguably the most significant year during the Jazz Age, if only because of the Scopes trial the O.J. Simpson-like proceedings of pre-television American history since it was the first trial to be broadcast on the relatively new social medium of the radio to the entire nation. Of course, Mencken was a major figure at the trial and even had a hand in concocting a strategy to defend the Dayton biology teacher, John T. Scopes, and use the affair to score points nationally against the folly of fundamentalism. Mencken's place, in fact, in the annals of U.S. history is wrapped up with the pieces he wrote from Tennessee about the people, the trial, and the antics of William Jennings Bryan. Mencken's only claim to Hollywood fame, a sure measure of national significance, comes in the figure of E.K. Hornbook, Hornbeck in the 1960 movie Inherent the Wind, and he's played by Gene Kelly. <clears throat> Mencken was not a good dancer, but... Uh, Machen only had a brush with greatness in Dayton. He was, by 1925, the nice, most articulate voice of conservatives in the mainline Presbyterian church, and that meant that Brian knew Machen, at least by reputation, 
if not through personal interactions at church meetings. Brian also belonged to the mainline Presbyterian Church, though it must be said that Brian was a son of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, which merged with the PCUSA in 1906. <clears throat> when the prosecution in Dayton began to assemble its list of expert witnesses, Brian con con contacted Machen to see if he could testify about the Genesis account of creation. Although Machen was resolute in his beliefs about the virgin birth and the resurrection of Christ, he did not read the opening chapters of the Bible as a scientific account of human origins. For that reason, he politely declined Brian's invitation and explained that he was not an expert in the Hebrew scriptures. He also had a previous commitment to accompany his widowed mother, Mary Gresham Machen, to their summer cottage in Seal Harbor, Maine. Machen was no doubt believed to be able to avoid the circus that Dayton became. Even so, when the New York Times asked him during the Scopes trial to write an article on what fundamentalism stands for now, which ran alongside a piece by the Stanford University entomologist Vernon L. Kellogg entitled, What Evolution Stands For Now, Machen did not refuse. He did, however, remain silent about evolution in the piece for the Times. What fundamentalism, he termed, a term he called distasteful, stood for was the way of salvation set forth in the Bible and historic Christianity. According to Machen, so-called fundamentalists opposed liberal or modernist Protestants for denying those beliefs. The summer of 1925 was merely a warm-up for the sub subsequent year, which saw Mencken and Machen each take center stage not as part of a larger drama, but simply on the merits of their own ideas and actions. Both, both ep episodes played out at roughly the same time, with initial scenes transpiring in the spring of 1926 at Boston and New Brunswick, New Jersey. Mencken's was the most more famous of the two, but both attracted national attention. Between 1926 and 1927, Mencken's provocative editorial pieces in the American Mercury, the, the magazine that he edited, caught up with him. The April issue of the magazine included the hat rack story by a man named Herbert Asbury, a direct descendant of Francis Asbury, the so-called father of American Methodism. Asbury the Younger story featured the life of a prostitute in a small town of Farmington, Missouri, who serviced clients from a local Protestant congregation in nearby cemeteries after the Sunday evening service. As Asbury put it in this story, six days a week, Hat Rack was a competent and more or less virtuous drudge employed by one of our best families, but Sunday was her day off, and she then in turn offered her soul to the Lord and went to the devil. <clears throat> the story was not sexually explicit and so avoided obscenity outright, but the lines then between decency and vulgarity were easy to cross in Victorian America. As much as Mencken enjoyed provoking the cultural establishment's gatekeepers, he also knew they could impede the regular flow of literary commer commerce, and so he worried about works that were obviously offensive. As he wrote in an essay in which he declared war against Puritanism as a literary force, written a full decade before this controversy, he wrote there, I am, in moments borrowed from the more plausible, palatable business, the editor of an American magazine, and I thus know at first hand what the burden is. The thing I always have to decide about a manuscript offered for, for publication before I ever give any thought to its artistic merit and suitability is the question of whether its publication will be permitted. Not even whether it is intrinsically good or evil, moral or immoral, but whether some roving Methodist preacher self-commissioned to keep watch on letters will read indecency into it. Not a week passes that I do not decline some sound and honest piece of work for no other reason. I have a long list of such things as American authors, well-devised, well-imagined, well-executed, respectable as human documents as any work of art, but never to be printed in mine or any other American magazine. So as much as Mencken was a provoker, he also knew that there were limits to what he could get away with. <clears throat> Another Methodist, J. Franklin Chase, the secretary of the New England Watch and Ward Society, confirmed Mencken's worries. The head of one of the nation's oldest censorship organizations, 
which had such respectable board members as Harvard University's president, Charles W. Eliot, Chase took Mencken's bait with the hat rack story. In fact, in 1925, Mencken had published two articles, Keeping the Puritans Pure and Boston Twilight, designed to rile censors like Chase. Asbury's story, though, crossed the line. On March 30th, 1926, Chase arranged with criminal justice authorities to have Felix Karagiannis, the owner of a newsstand in Harvard Square, arrested for selling obscene material, namely the American Mercury Magazine, the issue that featured the hat rack. Mencken, in turn, decided to call Chase's bluff by arranging to sell a copy of the magazine at Boston's Common. The editor hoped that police too would arrest him and thereby use the courts to expose the bizarre power that Chase had through a voluntary organization that lacked legal sanction. On April 5, soon after lunch, Mencken met Chase with approximately 1,000 people watching. On cue, Chase purchased the magazine from Mencken for a half dollar, which the editor promptly bit to ensure the coin's authenticity, mugging for the cameras. Chase ordered Mencken's arrest. At police headquarters, Mencken learned that his trial was scheduled for the next day. He expected the judge to find him guilty, much like John T. Scope's fate in Dayton. Mencken also planned to appeal and use that forum to embarrass the prosecution in much the same way that Clarence Darrow had tarnished William Jennings Bryan reputation at, in Tennessee. As it turned out, the trial had none of the drama that transpired in Dayton. Because the case involved charges of obscenity, Attorneys had to make arguments quietly before the judge to protect the spectators. Nobody could hear what they were saying. Also, because the presiding judge, James P. Parmenter, was a reasonable man, he found Mencken not guilty and dismissed the complaint. Mencken himself was surprised since he expected a guilty verdict and was planning for an appeal. <clears throat> that the twist may have been responsible for Mencken losing sight of Chase who had left Boston for New York City to ask the postmaster there to ban the next issue of the American Mercury from the mails. The offending article in view here was a piece by Bernard A. DeVoto entitled Sex and the Co-Ed. Mencken feared that it might offend censors and decided to halt the binding of the May issue in order to replace DeVoto's article with another. He was worried the magazine would lose its second class mailing status if both the April and May issues were delayed, in which case it would no longer be a continuous publication, which was required for second, um, for that status of second class mailing. The cost of redoing the May issue was $8,000, way more than any of the legal fees that M Mencken accrued during the entire court proceedings. Even so, Mencken had another trick or two up his sleeve. One was to have the courts bring an injunction against Chase's Watch and Ward Society Mencken also hinted the threat of a suit for damages against the society's endowment. Initially, the court sided with Mencken and found that citizens like Chase had no right to intimidate or coerce through fear of prosecution, the sale and distribution of a literary magazine. That was not, however, the final verdict. On appeal, Chase found a judge to reverse the injunction since the effort to ban the sale of the April issue was a one-time affair. The hat rack debate had gone from center stage to the theater's lobby in the course of a year, Mencken was still standing, but so was the Protestant moralism that underwrote Victorian America's claim to superiority. Machen's brush with the moral establishment came through the normal channels of Presbyterian church government. As Protestants who love to take a meeting, Presbyterians gather regularly to conduct church business which should make football their favorite sport since after every play there is a committee meeting. In the spring of 1926, Machen attended the, uh, the regular assembly of the Presbytery of New Jersey, to which he belonged as a professor at Princeton. It was a routine affair. Ever since the ratification of the 18th Amendment, the Presbyterian Church had strongly supported federal laws and policies that made the sale and distribution of alcohol illegal. Indeed, the roots of temperance went back a century earlier when Protestant activists conceived of the consumption of alcoholic beverages as a sin, 
even to the point of substituting grape juice for wine in the Lord's Supper. When a motion came from a member of the presbytery for the church to support officially the federal policy of prohibition, or reaffirm its support for this, because it had done it many times, no one was surprised, including Machen, even though he belonged to a family that opposed the 18th Amendment on gr the grounds of states' rights, that meaning that the federal government was usurp usurping its authority in turning America dry. Machen's older brother, Arthur, a seasoned attorney in Baltimore, actually ran for Congress in 1926 on the anti-prohibition party ticket. He lost. <clears throat> when the New Testament professor voted against the Presbytery Resolution, his reasons were constitutional, though in this case, Machen also appealed to the Constitution of the Church, which said that ecclesiastical bodies should refrain from meddling in civil affairs because the Church's calling was spiritual, not political. Machen made no speech. He did not insist that his vote be recorded. He knew his colleagues were so rapidly prohibitionist that he decided to pick other battles. Even so, Machen's, Machen's vote against the Presbytery's support for prohibition became a major, major point of controversy when the denomination met in Baltimore for its annual General Assembly a few weeks later. When Presbyterian officials gathered in Machen's hometown, one item on their agenda was a recommendation to promote the Baltimore scholar to full professor of apologetics and ethics. Machen already had a reputation as a provocateur thanks to his 1923 book, Christianity and Liberalism, in which, again, he argued that Protestants who equivocated on cardinal teachings of Christianity were guilty of adopting a different religion. As controversial as that argument was, the form in which Machen cast it was sufficiently reputable to gain praise from the likes of Walter Lippmann, the prominent political journalist who said that Machen's book showed acumen, saliency, and wit, and was the best popular argument produced by either side during the fundamentalist controversy. Machen's respectability, however, did not prevent the Presbyterian Church's officials from speaking against his promotion at the seminary. In fact, some questioned Machen's temperament and used his vo vote against prohibition as evidence of his compromised judgment. The, the logic went like this. How could someone who did not recognize the evil, evil of beverage alcohol teach ethics responsibly, responsibly to, to prospective pastors? So it was a package deal teaching apologetics. You also taught ethics. So Machen clearly didn't have a moral sense if he could not support prohibition. Machen's response to those objections actually showed a form of intellectual subtlety that might well aid young pastors <clears throat> studying for the ministry. He explained in a statement never released because his friends believed nothing he could say would absolve him of the guilt that came with taking the wrong side on the 18th Amendment. But he wrote this, no one has a greater horror of the evils of drunkenness than I or a greater detestation of any corrupt traffic which is sought to make profit out of this terrible sin. It is clearly, a duty, clearly the duty of the church to combat this evil. With regard Regard to the exact form, however, in which the power of the civil government is to be used in this battle, there may, may be difference of opinion. Zeal for temperance, for example, would hardly justify an order that all drunkards should be summarily butchered. Some men hold that the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act are not a wise method of dealing with the problem of intemperance, and that indeed those measures in the effort to accomplish moral good are really causing moral harm. Those who hold the view that I have just mentioned have a perfect right to their opinion so far as the law of our church is concerned. Important indeed are the functions of the police and members of the church in their capacity as citizens should aid by every proper means within their power in securing the discharge of those functions. But the duty of the church in its corporate capacity is of a quite different nature. So. You can take down your defund the police signs now. <clears throat> that statement pointed to Machen's own libertarian political convictions as well as his firm belief in a separation of church and state, so high that for some it might qualify as a Jeffersonian wall. By the time the Presbyterians in Baltimore had concluded their business, during which time they heard from Idaho Senator William E. Bora that the liquor traffic was a cursed 
to the human family and a test of the American people's capacity for constitutional government, church officials decided to put Machen's promotion on hold and to form a committee to investigate Princeton Seminary. The not so subtle message was that any school with Machen on the faculty needed closer inspection. The committee charged with investigating Princeton eventually recommended a reorganization that gave the president and trustees greater control over faculty. The administrative reform was tied up in the courts for a couple years, but when the dust settled, Machen left Princeton in 1929 to form a new school, Westminster, in Philadelphia. As Machen, sorry, as Mencken later wrote about the new seminary, Machen fell out with the reformers who've been trying in late years to convert the Presbyterian Church into a kind of literary and social club devoted vaguely to good works. He, he, his one and only purpose was to hold the church resolutely to what he conceived to be the true faith. When that enterprise met with opposition, he fought vigorously and though he lost in the end and was forced out of Princeton, it must be manifest that he marched off to Philadelphia with all the honors of war. Again, that was Mencken writing about Machen. A few years earlier, Mencken had also commented on, Mencken, on, on Machen's pro opposition to prohibition. Again, Mencken writing about Machen's opposition to prohibition. Keep that straight. <sighs> Mencken observed, if Christianity is really true, as Machen believes, then the Bible is true. And if the Bible is true, then it is true from cover to cover. So answering, he takes his stand upon it and defies the host of, hosts of Beelzebub to shake him. As I have hinted, I think that given his faith, his position is completely impregnable. There is absolutely no flaw in the arguments with which he supports it. If he is wrong, then the science of logic is a hollow vanity signifying nothing. Mencken went on. I have also noted that Dr. Machen is a wet, that is somebody who was opposed to a prohibition. This is somewhat remarkable in a Presbyterian, but certainly it is not illogical in a fundamentalist. He is a wet, I take it, simply because the Yahweh of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New are both wet, because the whole Bible is in fact wet. He not only refuses to expunge from the text anything that is plainly there, he also refuses to insert anything that is not there." End of quote. The irony, of course, is that the biblical scholar, not just the skeptical journalist, ran afoul of the cultural guardians of national greatness. Mencken was asking for it, but Machen, as professor at the Presbyterian's oldest seminary, was not the same sort of rabble-rouser, in which case the logical question remains, was there something in the water in Baltimore? <clears throat> of course, Baltimore only explains so much in Machen's case. This is a theology conference, and so a word needs to be said on behalf of doctrine. It should go without saying that Machen was an adherent and defender of Reformed theology. His classic critique of liberal theology in Christianity and liberalism was a fulsome lesson in the basic doctrines of historic Protestantism. In fact, the one doctrine that took up the most space in the book was the vicarious atonement. A brief dip into that section of Christianity and liberalism, excuse me, may be useful for exploring how Machen's Calvinism functioned as a skeptical barrier to the sentimentality of mainline Protestantism and the broader moralism of America's cultural consensus. Notice first that liberal theologians and mainstream pastors had turned the cross, the cross into a model of self-sacrifice. At least that, that's how Machen heard the common explanations of Christ's death. He described it this way, modern liberal preachers do indeed sometimes speak of the atonement, but they speak of it just as seldom as they possibly can and one can see plainly that their hearts are elsewhere than at the foot of the cross. Indeed, at this point, as, as at many others, one has the feeling that traditional language is being strained to become the expression of to totally alien ideas. And when the, tr the traditional phrases have been stripped away, the essence of the modern conception of the death of Christ, though that conception appears in many forms, is fairly plain. The essence of it is that the death of Christ had an effect not upon God, but upon man. Sometimes the effect upon man is conceived of in a very simple way, Christ's death being regarded merely as an example of self-sacrifice for us to emulate. The, the, the uniqueness of this particular example then can be found only in the fact that Christian sentiment 
Gathering around it has made it a con con convenient symbol for self-sacrifice. End of quote. Machen would not, however, let liberals hollow out either the physical enormity of Christ's death on the cross or the eternal significance of it. He wrote, Jesus is our Savior, not by virtue of what he said, not even by virtue of what he was, but by what he did. He is our Savior, <clears throat> not because he has inspired us to live the same kind of life that he lived, but because he took upon himself the dreadful guilt of our sins and bore it instead of us on the cross. Such is the Christian conception of the cross of Christ. It is ridiculed as being a subtle theory of the atonement. In reality, it is the plain teaching of the word of God. We know absolutely nothing about an atonement that is not a vic vicarious atonement, <clears throat> for that is the only atonement of which the New Testament speaks. And this Bible doctrine is not intricate or subtle. On the contrary, though it involves mysteries, it is, it is itself so simple that a child can understand it. We deserved eternal death, but the Lord Jesus, because he loved us and died instead of us on the cross, surely there is nothing so very intricate about that, end of quote. Nothing intricate, but also nothing uh, easy to sugarcoat. We deserve death because of sin. Christ suffered a gruesome death on the cross to take our place and to atone for our sins. A child may have an easy time understanding, but in today's participation trophy culture, telling a child about sin, death, and the cross might prompt some to call the social services. These different versions of the atonement reveal an important contrast, one that still afflicts contemporary Protestantism and finds its way into so-called conservative Protestant or evangelical circles, sectors, excuse me. It is the difference between Christians who care and Christians who are mean. At some big Eva outlets, the polemics that made old Princeton and old Westminster such useful instructors in Christian conviction are often regarded as expressions of an angry or unloving disposition. Of course, Reformed Protestants can be jerks, but resorting to the charge of Calvinists are mean, the way that nice Calvinists who want to own the sacred ground of earnest land do, that may be a sign of a piety that esteems caring at the expense of truth. For instance, this is how someone wrote about mean Calvinists. It is tempting to point out that Calvinists don't have a corner on the ugly side of the blogosphere. <clears throat> Wade into some of the posts and comments from other traditions talking about ultimate things, and you will see that every tribe has their cranks who can be mocking, rude, sarcastic, and nasty. Yet for various reasons, people associate and expect anger with Calvinism, making the explicit connection more regularly. This person goes on to write, but none of that is to deny that there is a problem. Angry Calvinists are not like unicorns, dreamed up in some fantasy. They really do exist, and the stereotype exists for a reason. Another person, writing at a similar blog site, wrote this, the stereotype of mean Calvinists exists for a reason. This wasn't, I don't think this was written by ChatGPT, although it might sound like it. There's a reason, after all, that cliches become cliches. If you spend any time in evangelical social media or have a more traveled experience in evangelical church or churches, you've been on the receiving end of a mean Calvinist before. If you're like me, you've wondered at some point, what do those who subscribe to the doctrines of grace, why do they seem so frequently graceless? Is there something in particular about Calvinism that makes people mean? What is important to notice in this contrast between nice Calvinism and mean Calvinist is that niceness is the lens through which to read the headlines that I talked about at the beginning of this talk. Here's one example. Okay, I'll identify the website. It's the Gospel Coalition. <laughs> um, this is writing about, um, about COVID. Our hope rests not in fully stocked shelves and ample disinfectant, but in the saving blood of Christ, who gave his life so that one day all disease and pestilence will vanish from the earth. As the headlines scroll across our screens and anxiety mounts in our chests, let his love for us rather than fear for ourselves spur us to action. Here's the action. Remember to wash your hands. Remember to stay home when you're sick. And most of all, remember to do this not out of panic, but of love for your neighbor. The 80-year-old in the third pew, the non- Agenarian in the choir, 
the transplant recipient at work because Christ loved us first. Uh, and then there are other ways that the website also said that Christians can practically love our neighbors during moments of crisis. One of those was glorifying God by obeying authorities. One of the primary ways regular people can help curb the spread of a virus is to comply with recommendations. Remember, we do this not in fear and self-preservation, but as an act of love to the vulnerable whom this sickness might kill. Much of this, is com of this compliance can become worship-filled worship acts. Wash your hands and say a 20-second prayer for your neighbors while you do so. Lord, protect the vulnerable from this virus. Bump elbows instead of hugging and intentionally pass peace while you do so. Peace be with you. <clears throat> One doesn't have to imagine how Machen would respond to this binary of gullible caring versus common sense. Because in his day, the division between the nice and the mean, between the caring and the unloving, was equally strong. In fact, you could possibly argue that so many of the unhealthy social dynamics that afflict contemporary America started during the 1920s and played out first among mainline Protestants. Machen often heard that conservatives were the ones to be blamed for the dispute in the church, as if liberalism, the social gospel, and ecumenism were as good and right as electric vehicles, COVID vaccines, and mail-in ballots. Listen to all the ways that Machen heard that he needed to accentuate the positive. These are quotes from him in one of his essays, but he's quoting, he's, he's, he's saying what liberals are saying about fighters like Machen. Let us above all have no controversy in the church. Let us forget our small theological differences and all repeat together Paul's hymn to Christian love. That was one. Another, our theological differences will disappear if we will just get down on our knees together in prayer. <clears throat> and another, instead of engaging in controversy in the church, we ought to pray for a revival. Instead of polemics, we ought to have evangelism. And yet another, instead of engaging in controversy about doctrine, we ought to seek the power of the living Holy Spirit. And one more, our preaching should be positive and not negative. We can preach the truth without attacking error. <clears throat> now, Machen had a response, as you might imagine, and it was, in effect, what Bible are you reading? <clears throat> and Machen wrote this, if we follow that advice, we shall have to close our Bible and desert its teachings. The New Testament is a polemic book almost from beginning to end. One of the most eminent theological professors in the country said the real presence of Paul's <clears throat> teaching is found in the hymn to Christian love in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And we can avoid controversy today if we will only devote the chief attention to that inspiring hymn. In reply, I am bound to say that the example was singularly ill-chosen. <clears throat> Now notice, he didn't say it was ridiculous the way that maybe Theobros today might say it. He said it was only ill-chosen. That hymn to Christian love, Machen goes on, is in the midst of a great polemic passage. It would never have been written if Paul had been opposed to controversy with error in the church. Every great Christian utterance, it may almost be said, is born in controversy. It is when men have felt compelled to take a stand against error that they have risen to the really great heights in the celebration of truth. Whether growing up in Baltimore, worshiping at a Baltimore church, attending a Baltimore university for both his BA and MA, and reading Baltimore newspapers was responsible for Machen's capacity to see the hollowness of calls to love, unity, and peace. To recognize that niceness is not a fruit of the spirit is certainly open to debate. But Machen's recognition of polemics in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is not that far from Mencken's own assessments of Protestantism during the era. And what both saw was that the aspects of the Bible, many aspects of the Bible do not fit with sentimentality. That, and that sentimentality contradicted predictions of human flourishing that ignored the obvious failings of human beings, that was a trait that both Mencken shared with Machen. Each man came down on opposite sides of scripture's claims in ways comparable 
to the opposite sides of Baltimore's tracks on which they lived. But for a brief period, the American nation had to reckon with both agnostic and confessional Presbyterian calls to grow up and face the facts of both human folly and biblical truth. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture. You can find all the addresses from the 2023 Reformed Forum Theology Conference by visiting reformedforum.org rf23.